All right. Many people find themselves asking the question, am I worth celebrating? And you don't have to think about it. How quickly can you come up with five of your most recent achievements? Now, if you struggle with coming up with five recent achievements, you're not alone. Many people struggle to identify their successes. Too much of the time, we hardly doubt we've accomplished that much. And even in our accomplishments, whether they're worth celebrating or not. Think about it like this. You ever meet a young, hardworking mother and she makes sure to inform you of her incompetence as a parent, even though you know that she's got everything together. She's holding her house together, keeping everything in order. She has a job that she excels in amazingly and she's really great with her children, but nevertheless, she'll still let you know of her, <clears throat> of her incompetence as a parent. And the same thing as the studious teenager. You can compliment the studious teenager on their high grades and they'll tell you it was an easy subject. It was a fluke. I got lucky on that test. Now, do we really have these accomplishments to celebrate or not? And what is it that, that we, why is it that we find it so hard for ourselves in our lives to really celebrate our accomplishments instead of <clears throat> celebrating them, we're so easy to put them down. And especially when it comes to the spiritual arena and our spiritual accomplishments, take the person who goes to the furthest end just to keep Shabbat, struggles with keeping Shabbat, but does it anyways, or the person keeping kosher. And they'll tell you, oh, I'm no religious person in any way, shape, or form, or the person who puts on the tefillin every day the woman who lights Shabbos candles every Friday. But nevertheless, they'll say, mm, no, I'm not a very religious person. I'm not doing that great. And we do this all the time in all areas of our lives. And the question is, why is it that we are so set on looking at it from that perspective, that there's nothing here to celebrate? What happened to our accomplishments and the things that we have done? Now, we will approach this issue by first examining the reason why we celebrate Hanukkah. And there will be some important insight to discuss on this, but as we'll see, just as a quick refresher in the Hanukkah story and a little bit of the background of the celebration. And that is that in the second century before the common era, the Holy Land, land of Israel was ruled. The land of Israel was ruled by the Syrian Greeks, or the Seleucids, the Seleucids who tried to force the Jewish people to accept Greek culture and beliefs instead of mitzvahs and mitzvah observance and belief in God. Now, after a series of unbearable escalations of oppression, a small band of faithful but poorly armed Jews rebelled against the occupying forces and drove them out of Israel. Led by a priest named Yehuda, the Maccabees finally maintained, <clears throat> maintained control over the Holy Land and the Holy Temple, the Beis Hamikdash, which had been defiled by the Greeks. Finally, after clearing through the mess, through the rubble that was there from destroyed articles, they finally found one jug of uncontaminated oil, and that jug of uncontaminated oil was used to light the menorah, which ended up lasting for eight days, even though it should have only lasted one. Now, when it comes to celebrating the miracle of Hanukkah, what miracle is it that we are celebrating? Is it the victory of the war, or was it the miracle of the jug of oil? In order to appreciate this, let's take a look at a classic text, from the Talmud. And the Talmud itself asks, my Hanukkah, what is Hanukkah? And the Talmud goes on that the sages taught on the 25th day of Kislev, there are eight days of Hanukkah. One may not eulogize on them and one may not fast on them because when the Greeks entered the sanctuary, they defiled all the oil that was in the sanctuary. When the Hasmonean monarchy overcame them and emerged victorious, they searched 
and found only one jug of oil with the high priest's seal remaining. There was sufficient oil there to light the menorah for only one day. A miracle occurred, and they lit from the one jug for eight days. The next year, the sages instituted those days and made them holidays with the, re the recitation of Hallel and special Thanksgiving. Now, what we see clearly from this is that the Talmud is emphasizing the miracle of the oil. From a simple reading of the Talmud, you would think that there was a minor spat over a room in the temple between the Greeks and the Hasmoneans. The Greeks entered, they made some kind of balagan, they threw a few things on the floor, defiling the oils, whatever oil they can get their hands on, and they left. When the Hasmoneans took over control of that room, it doesn't define some great all-out war throughout the country. And the Talmud goes on to say that that one jug of oil lasted for eight days, and that was the miracle. Yeah. And many of the commentaries point out over here, because you might say, let's maybe this Talmud is a little bit out of context, and that we're discussing an aspect of Hanukkah as opposed to the essence of what Hanukkah is all about. But the commentaries right away jump to it, and they say when the Talmud asks, my Hanukkah, what is Hanukkah? The Talmud is asking, what is the reason for celebrating on Hanukkah? At least according to some of the commentary. However, let's take a look at Maimonides, and he seems to see things a little bit different than the Talmud, or maybe not, as we shall explore. And Maimonides reads as follows. And again, this is in his book of laws. And he goes and he says, in the second temple era, the Greek kingdom issued decrees decrees against the Jewish people attempting to nullify their faith and refusing to allow them to observe the Torah and its commandments. They extended their hands against their property and their daughters. They entered the sanctuary, wrought havoc within, and made the sacred impure. The Jews suffered great difficulties, for they oppressed them greatly until the God of our ancestors had mercy upon them, delivered them from their hands, and saved them. The sons of the Hasmoneans, the high priests, overcame, slew them, and saved the Jews from their hand. They appointed a king from the priests, and sovereignty returned to Israel for more than 200 years until the destruction of the second temple. The Rambam seems to be, Maimonides seems to be telling a completely different story than the Talmud was talking about. The Talmud just says that the Greeks came into the temple, they defiled some oil, left, and the miracle happened with the jug. Maimonides goes into a great history of the war between the Greeks and the Jewish people. Or more properly, not the Greeks, but the, the Seleucids that tried conquering over the Jewish nation. They rebelled. They staged a rebellion. They stood their ground. And they eventually won, with God's help, of course. And that in itself was extremely miraculous to the point that the Ramam feels, Maimonides feels it important to point out that this victory gave the Jews some form of autonomy for the next 200 years until the temple was ultimately destroyed roughly the year 70. Then Maimonides continues and he says, when the Jews overcame their enemies and destroyed them, they entered the sanctuary this was on the 25th of Kislev. They could not find any pure oil in the sanctuary, except for a single jug. It contained enough oil to burn for merely one day. They lit the arrangement of candles from it for eight days until they could crush olives and produce pure oil. In other words, only after all of these details of the history does the Maimonides jump to the point of the miracle of the oil which lasted for eight days. And then finally, Maimonides concludes, and that's why they established that there should be an eight-day holiday starting on the 25th day of Kislev, days of rejoicing, singing praises, and lighting the candles. Now, the seemingly seeming issues here are as follows. On one hand, it seems that Maimonides is contradicting the Talmud. From the Talmud, it would seem. From the Talmud, it would seem 
that the main focus, if not the only focus, is on the jug of oil, on the miracle of the oil. The Talmud almost omits the victory of, at least the, the military victory. And if that's the case, why would the Talmud omit a, a military victory? And secondly, why would the Maimonides seemingly contradict the Talmud? Are they telling two separate stories? Are we celebrating two different events? What exactly is going on over here? And in truth, what would be the purpose of even debating this idea? What would the argument even be? And would there be any relevance? Now, in truth, everybody agrees on the historical events. Be it Maimonides or the Talmud, as clearly stated in other sources, and for those who know the history of it, whether it's from what is known as the Medrash Hanukkah, the Book of the Maccabees, or what is known as the Megillah of Antiochus. Antiochus was the name, the Antiochus IV was the name of the king ruling at the time, at least over that part of the world, over Judea. And if that's the case, what exactly is going on over here? So let's approach this from the point of what relevance would it be whether we're celebrating the military victory or the victory over the oil. And the question is like this. You see, when it comes to Jewish holidays, sorry, when it comes to Jewish holidays, there's a very simple formula. There was a particular nation who rose up to try to destroy the Jewish people. They failed. God saved us. Now let's eat. And we have that on repeat throughout the year, from beginning of the year to the end of the year, several times throughout the year. That's how we celebrate our holidays. Now, on Hanukkah, are we supposed to eat or not? In other words, is there a mitzvah? Is there a command to have a festive meal similar to having a festive meal on any of the other holidays, like Purim, like Pesach, and the likes? So, we have over here a reading from Rabbi Yaakov ben Asher, known as the Tour. Rabbi Yaakov ben Asher lived in Spain in the late 1300s, in the late 1200s, early 1300s. He wrote one of the foremost formulated works on Jewish law, post Talmud, obviously. And he writes as follows quoting Rabbi Meir of Rottenberg. Meir Rottenberg was one of the fathers of Ashkenazic Jewry, or at least um, Ashkenazic, Ashkenazic customs and whatnot. And he wrote, writes as follows. Our mayor would say that the many feasts, some stage during the days of Hanukkah, are only optional. There is no mitzvah to serve a special Hanukkah meal since the holiday was not established as one of feasting and drinking, but rather one of thanksgiving and praise alone. Now, the rationale to this idea is that essentially, if we are celebrating this miracle of the oil, what was the oil? The cel celebrating the miracle of oil was a supernatural event, how one jug of oil lasted for eight days, representing how the liberators of the Holy Temple were able to perform a mitzvah, a spiritual act with a spiritual response and a supernatural miracle. And because of that, through that lens, Many see that this miracle was, or at least this celebration, is supposed to be completely spiritual. How do we celebrate Hanukkah? We light candles. We sing praises and songs to God, representing a spiritual victory. However, Maimonides, the Rambam, on the other hand, views the victories, at least the celebration, a little bit different. As pointed out, we're celebrating a military victory over here, in addition to the oil, and therefore as we see codified by the Bach, as he is known, otherwise known as Rabiel Circus, who lived in Poland in the mid to late 1500s. And he writes that according to Maimonides, it comes out that there is a mitzvah, there is a positive, there's a commandment to eat special foods on Hanukkah, celebrating with a meal because it was a very physical, they tried to kill us, let's eat, as the Jewish formula goes. And that would be the practical difference between the approach of, is it about the oil or is it about the military victory? Now, based on that idea, 
So according to Maimonides, how do we reconcile the fact that the Gemara, the Talmud says, what is Hanukkah and Hanukkah's that we celebrate because the oil lasted for eight days, is Maimonides not contradicting the Gemara, the Talmud? And in truth, the answer is no. Because what's the, the Talmud's real question is, if we are, according to Maimonides, if we are celebrating the victory of war, why should we celebrate for eight days? Right? How long is Purim? Purim is one day. Why? Because the victory happens in one day. And the same thing is with Pesach. God took us out of Egypt, happened on one day, so we celebrate on one day. And if that's the case, the Talmud's asking, so why celebrate Hanukkah for eight days? The Talmud doesn't need to mention the victory of the war because that is so obvious to the Talmud. Because of course we're going to celebrate the victory of the war. Why wouldn't we? You see how amazing the war was? They were outnumbered by the thousands. But nevertheless, they conquered them. They won. We won. Obviously, we're going to celebrate for that. The Talmud's question is, why are we celebrating for eight days? To which the Talmud answers, because of the miracle of that cruise of oil, which lasted for eight days, which was supernatural. And therefore, it's not a contradiction the way that Maimonides, the way we're reading Maimonides and the Talmud, we're talking about two separate focuses. Maimonides is filling in that background of what is missing why we're celebrating even one day. And the Talmud is referring to why we're celebrating for eight days. However, there is something that we can all agree on. We don't have to argue about everything as the Ramar of Amosha Isserlis, known as the father of codifying Ashkenazic Jewish law, says even though it may not be a full-fledged mitzvah, but it is a little bit of a mitzvah to feast during these days. And guess what? You don't need to just feast and have it just be a little bit of a mitzvah. If you will sing songs of praise to God during this feast, during this meal, it is a full-fledged mitzvah. And therefore, we can all agree that over Hanukkah, we will celebrate with the meals, and it is a mitzvah when done properly. Now, what is really going on over here? In other words, where does this whole difference come into play? But from the perspective that according to the other approach, that the miracle is all about the oil. As we mentioned in the first opinion and many of the other commentaries on the Talmud that see the sole reason why we celebrate Hanukkah is because of the miracle of the oil. And when it comes to the idea of celebrating the victory, to a certain extent, the military victory is omitted. Why? How can we just gloss over and only focus on the miracle of the oil? What about the miracle of the war? And the idea is like this. In order to appreciate this, we have to understand what led to this rebellion. What was the, so to say, the, the historical background to that put everything into motion? You see, Already from when the first temple, the first base of Mikdash was destroyed by the Babylonians in the year 423 before the Common Era, until the revolt of the Maccabees in the year 140 before the Common Era, the land changed hands between different rulers, the Babylonians, the Persians, the Greeks, until the, that time. And most of that time, the Jews chose, the Jewish people chose to live peacefully under these different rulers to the point that the Talmud tells a fascinating story in the beginning of the reign of Alexander the Great, the great warrior. And it tells a story of how he was once passing through Yerushalayim, Jerusalem, with his soldiers. And they sent a delegation from the temple of priests led by the high priest known as Shimon HaTzadik. As Shimon HaTzadik with his delegation was going to greet Alexander the Great along with his soldiers, thousands of soldiers traveling with him, anybody who heard Alexander was coming was struck with fear. And as Alexander sees the high priest Shimon HaTzadik, Alexander hops off his horse and prostrates himself, bows down to Shimon HaTzadik. Everybody there is standing in awe. Alexander doesn't bow down to anybody. When he got back up, he was asked, what is going on over here? Why are you showing such honor and reverence to the high priest? And Alexander told over, he said, every time before I would go out to war, 
a man would come to me in a vision, a dream, and would tell me that I would be successful at war. And he points to Shimon at Zadik and says, it was this man who would guide me. It was this man who told me. And it was at that point, Alexander wanted to erect a statue in the Holy Temple as showing his grace and his kindness and his thankfulness to the Jewish people for his victories. Um, that was how he wanted to show it. And of course, he couldn't have been told no, otherwise it would have been unfortunately bloodshed. But they made a compromise. And Shimon Atzalik said, the next year, every Kohen, and some say every Jew that will be born in Yerushalayim, as a way of commemorating you, will be named Alexander. And that's how the name Alexander became a Jewish name from then on, still to this very day. And that's where it comes from. And that Alexander was satisfied with. Now, moving along. So roughly 35 years before the rev revolt of the Maccabees, which we said took place in the year 140 before the Common Era, there rose a madman, a king named Antiochus, who was given rulership over this part of the world by the Greek empire, obviously. And he had this idea that the systematic suppression of the Jewish belief and practice, for some reason he felt that Judaism and the belief of the Jews was his number one enemy. Now, this didn't start off with violent oppression, at least not openly. It was a way that Antiochus used his power to replace all Jewish spiritual leaders with, Hellen with Hellenist puppets to the point that he would hire and he would replace the high priest at his own will, obviously using his power and his force to do it, to the point that his entire goal was to just root out all belief in God and replace it with cultural icons. Now, Antiochus was extremely powerful because <clears throat> what happened was he really transformed most of the Jewish people to accept the Hellenist ways. There was only a small group of Jews who refused and resisted. And when their resistance became powerful enough to catch his attention, Antiochus realized enough's enough, I have to start using brute force. And that's when, in addition to years earlier, just raising the taxes to an exuberant amount of money, he started to physically oppress the Jewish people, whether it was by making decrees that were punishable by death, such as somebody who would learn the Torah. Torah scrolls were burnt in the open. Anybody who would keep Shabbos, circumcision, laws of kosher, these were all penalties, punish, uh, these were all uh, prohibitions punishable by death. In addition to the mass rapes and kidnappings that they staged and they would go from village to village forcing jews to bow down to pagan gods to the point that antiochus conquered the holy temple and turned it into a house of pagan worship and it is at this point that the maccabees come to the scene the maccabees known by their name the small group band of brothers who i guess mastered guerrilla warfare to fight off these Seleucids or the Greeks, their name Maccabee comes from an acronym of the words Mi Kamoicha Ba'elim Adenoi, which means, Who is like you among the heavenly powers, O God? And their battle cry before going out to war would be, Mi Lahashem Eli, whoever is for God, come with me. Clearly seeing that the purpose of their fight was not political or self-determination. Rather, it was to save spiritual existence, the existence of the Jewish people. The belief in God, the practice of Judaism, that is what they were fighting for. We see this as clearly in a text from a book called The Levush. The Levush was written by Rabbi Mordechai Yafi, who lives, was the great rabbi in Prague and then in Posen, he was one of the greatest rabbis of his time. He lived in the 16th century. And he writes, explaining as follows. Let's, he differentiates between Purim and Hanukkah. And he writes as follows. Purim involved a decree by Haman to physically obliterate the Jewish people. As such, it is fitting to celebrate the physical survival of our nation by engaging in the physical pleasures of eating and drinking. By contrast, Hanukkah is a celebration of the victory of the Jewish spirit 
over the pressure exerted by Hellenistic culture, the Greeks did not threaten to kill the Jews, but rather issued decrees against the, perform the performance of numerous Torah commandments. Antiochus did this as the common practice of conquerors imposing their faith and culture on their victims, after which all he would do was tax them and nothing more. Therefore, Hanukkah's main focus is spiritual, to give thanks and praise God, who helped us regain our independence, thereby preserving our religious identity. And ultimately, that is the difference between Hanukkah and Purim. But was it a physical victory or was it a spiritual victory? The Maccabees were fighting a war and it was a great military, military victory. However, what was the purpose of this fight? What was the purpose of this war and what were they actually fighting for? It was for religious freedom. Now, based on this, getting back to the two opinions from before, everybody agrees of the importance of recognizing both miracles, that of the military war and that of the candles, that of the oil that lasted for eight days, representing that religious freedom, that hope and that faith not to be crushed by those who suppress us, those who oppress us. However, when it comes to focusing on what the miracle was all about, one perspective is that yes, there was a war, but let's look at why we were fighting the war in the first place and let's celebrate that. And that's the celebration that the entire miracle and the entire celebration was spiritual. And then there is the view of Maimonides which we brought that we are going to focus on the war as an entity of itself as well and celebrate that as well as celebrating the miracle of the eight nights of the oil that lasted, representing that religious freedom and what we stood for. Okay. Now, based on this, let's turn back to the beginning conversation that we had in the beginning of the class. And that was about celebrating our own victories. But in order to do this, let's look at the general culture of celebrating within Judaism. Overall, just a quick refresher. We look back at different holidays throughout the year, like Rosh Hashanah, the day human beings were created. Yom Kippur, the day God forgave us for the golden calf. On Sukkot, how God sheltered us in the desert. On Pesach, God saved us from freedom. On Purim, when we were rescued from genocide. However, all of these miracles and all these celebrations are looking back at, back at events that happened to us. The Torah, at the same time, also focuses on celebrating our own achievements. So, for example, the holiday of Simchas Torah is celebrating our achievement of going an entire year through the Torah cycle, the Torah reading. Another example of this would be there's something called a siyum. When somebody finishes what is called a tractate of the Talmud or the Mishnah, as the Talmud states clearly, Abaye, one of the sages of the Talmud states, may I receive my reward for when I see a young Torah scholar who has completed a tractate that he studied, I make a feast for the sages and has brought down codified in the Jewish code of law that it's a mitzvah to rejoice and make a festive meal when one completes a tractate of Talmud. This meal is considered a mitzvah meal. In other words, what we clearly see from Judaism overall, from all aspects, is that we must celebrate the things that happen to us, the things that God does for us, and we also have to celebrate where we put in our effort and our own achievements. We may not be able to split the sea, but our achievements are worth celebrating, and the Torah mandates that we celebrate that. Funny, as if it has to be mandated. But unfortunately, like we spelled out in the beginning of the class, most people are not very good at celebrating their own victories. Most people will write off their victories as a fluke or, or anything of the like. And the question that we are coming to now again, as we asked in the beginning of the class, is why is it that way? Why is it so hard for us to celebrate our own victories? And the idea is like this. One reason why we focus so much on the negative you can make a beautiful event, give a beautiful presentation, a beautiful project, work hard at something, and you come to the end. We always look back at the negative 
because we think that that's the best way to learn what not to do next time. We're trying to improve. So we tell ourselves, let's look back at the negative and we'll focus on that instead of focusing on the positive and do the positive even better next time. But that's a separate discussion. There's another perspective, another way that I'd like to take it tonight, and that is a mistaken identity. And the idea is as follows. We all make bad choices in life. No one is immune to mistakes. That's part of life. However, we have a big issue that when it happens when we make a mistake or enough mistakes, we finally ask ourselves, who am I? And we think like this, if I am good, then how do I reconcile all my wrongdoings? Don't they make me bad? And if I'm bad, you know, that's usually what we're more comfortable just coming to that conclusion. It takes away a lot of responsibility and it takes certain ownership from certain things. And at the end of the day, if we, so, we associate our conduct with our identity, in other words, our behavioral data will inevitably remind us that we are flawed, which is true. However, the problem is we are defining ourselves based on those actions. And that's not true to who we are. You see, we're so comfortable with writing off our success as a fluke, but owning our failure as who we are. And is that the truth? I think not. But in order to understand this, in order to appreciate this, let's take a look at a classic Hasidic idea. And that is that the Alter Rebbe was born in the year 1745. In the year 1788, published the work called the Tanya. In the Tanya, he explores, and this is generally referred to as the Bible of Hasidism, and he explores the concept how we all have within us two souls. There's the godly soul, and that is the soul which desires only goodness and purity. That is the part of us that pursues purpose, seeks spirituality, and wants to do the right thing at all times, no matter what the cost is. That soul is truly altruistic. Then there's the other soul, and that is the animalistic part of ourselves. That is the animalistic soul, which only seeks survival, has selfish tendencies, desires materialism and gratification, even when it comes at the price of sin. And there's this constant battle, this constant struggle within us. As he explains in Tanya, we are like that city. And there are two kings constantly battling within us for our, for our identity. Do I want to identify this way? Do I want to identify that way? Am I going to act based on my animal soul or am I going to act based on my godly soul? Which one will eventually conquer and be able to take over my thought, speech, and action? Now, in truth, when we fail, it's not who we are. We were conquered by the enemy. But at the same time, every time we were victorious, that is who we truly are. That is our true identity, that godly soul. And if that's the case, every one of those victories, we should look at them as our identifying factor, not using our failures to identify ourselves and become who we are. And this is one of the amazing insidious ploys of the negative side within us, which is hell-bent on bringing us down. It's what causes us to retreat and self-sabotage that even when we can easily win, it tricks us into thinking that it isn't normal to struggle. And if you're struggling, it means there's something wrong, deeply wrong with you or with us. And if that's the case, the moment we know there's a struggle, whether we win or we lose, we automatically tell ourselves that we're flawed and we're tainted and there's something wrong over here. However, this is the opposite of the truth. This couldn't be further from the truth, I should say. As the altar of it continues and he says, for this reason, no person should feel depressed, nor should his heart become exceedingly troubled from all these failures, at least this struggle. Because though he may be engaged in this conflict for the rest of his days, and really it's day in, day out, and it's all the time, perhaps it was for this very reason that he was created, for this mission to continually overcome evil, that constant struggle and that battle within us. And the truth is, we have to celebrate every single one of these victories. 
and even just pushing away that negative thought about ourselves, that negative thought that's distracting us, that in itself is worth celebrating as a victory in and of itself. Now, as the Alter Rebbe continues over there, Tanya, to explain how even just refraining from sin, that in itself is something that we get reward for because that in itself is a victory in this case and we can understand how that inner struggle, it's normal. It's there. We were created that way. Who do you think put it there in the first place? It's part of who we are. And the idea is like this. The bottom line is that not only can we celebrate victories, but we must because it's a legitimate, legitimate victory and your flamboyant spirit will only rack up more wins. In other words, when we celebrate these victories and we feel good about ourselves and we can properly identify who we truly are, not based on our mistakes, but on our true, based on our true identity, then we're able to rise up to the challenge day in, day out. Now, celebrating the struggle doesn't mean that it's over, but it helps us at least see things from a clear perspective, knowing who we are and knowing what we're able to accomplish. Based on this idea, there's a beautiful, there's a beautiful letter from the Rebbe, Rabbi Menachem Schneerson, in regards to celebrating a bar mitzvah. And if you think about it, the way the Rebbe gets into this question is, why do we celebrate a bar bas mitzvah? Right? When a Jewish boy and girl turn 12 or 13 years old, we celebrate, we throw a huge party. If you think about it, why are we celebrating? The bar and bat mitzvah is when this person is going to start struggling for the first time in their lives because until now they weren't necessarily responsible for their moral actions. They weren't responsible as their own person making their own choices. They've been educated, they've been trained, they've been going through a process. And it's at this point where in Jewish law they now become responsible and that's when you're gonna celebrate? What do you mean? This person's just starting the struggles of their lives their moral struggles and their responsibility as their own human being. So what's there to celebrate? How do you know how, what it's going to end up looking like? And the Rebbe says the answer is simple. A central tenet in Jewish law is that every Jew is treated with the assumption of being righteous, meaning it is assumed that every Jew surely follows every one of the mitzvahs. Maimonides attributes this to the core identity of a Jew, that every Jew innately wishes to perform all the mitzvahs and distance themselves from sins. Moreover, this status can be reacquired at any moment. As it says in Tanya, any average person can reach a state where they are considered to have never sinned. So when a young person becomes a newly obligated bar or bat mitzvah, we joyously mark the day and celebrate. We know they will prevail. And the truth is, we can appreciate this idea on a regular birthday and really every day. On a regular year when a person celebrates a birthday, at least for some of us, are we really celebrating a birthday because the past however many years have been the greatest years and that we've always accomplished and we've never made mistakes? Or every morning when we wake up, do we think that God is giving me a new day because yesterday I was a saint and yesterday I had the greatest accomplishments? Sometimes not. But nevertheless, why is God giving me this new day? Why is God giving me this new year? Is because at this point, there's a brand new opportunity for me to accomplish something, for me to accomplish a win, for me to get in touch with my true identity of who I truly am. Because that struggle is part of life. It was always put there, it was put there by God. It was something that I was always meant to use, to struggle with, but to be victorious over. Now, at times it can be overwhelming. Sometimes it seems like it's too late to fight and the odds are stacked against us. So what do we do then? What do we do when we feel like we're overrun? And this, the Hanukkah story reminds us, never give up fighting the good fight. And we see this in the prayers. We praise God and we thank him, delivering the mighty into the hands of the weak, the many into the hands of the few, the impure into the hands of the pure, the wicked into the hands of the righteous and the wanton sinners into the hands of those who are dedicated to your Torah. Over here, we are talking about two different battles. There's the battles between the Jews and the Greeks. 
the Hasmoneans, the Hashmonaim and the Greeks, and between the Hashmonaim and the, Hel Hel the Hellenized Jews. But what was the end of the story was that the Jewish people survived and thrived. And the same applies to the war within ourselves. We will be victorious. And it's at this point that the Rebbe highlights the, important, the importance of celebrating, not just post-victory, but even before the victory, because we know how important it is when a soldier goes to war, knowing that they will be victorious. How much more vigor they're able to fight with, how much more power and excitement they are able to go to war with. And therefore, this Hanukkah story teaches us, never underestimate yourself, never give up fighting that fight and realize that we can always overcome it. Think about this small group of soldiers. Do you think that they were able to fathom that they would have a miraculous victory on the battlefield? Do you think that they would fathom that they'd one day take over the temple once again? They just did whatever they could. Coming to the temple after winning the war, they had no idea what they would find, but that didn't stop them from searching for the jug of oil. When they realized they only had one jug of oil, they could have been despondent. They could have been depressed. We know it's going to take eight days to get new oil. This is only enough oil for one day. And they could have just given up and walked out right there, but they didn't give up. They had no idea a miracle would occur, but what did they do? They fought. They lit the menorah. They acted. And that created the miracle of Hanukkah. Essentially, Hanukkah is one of those miracles that was created by the Jewish people, by the people who stood up and stood up for what was right. So let's be like the Menorah. Let's shine our light, celebrate our victories, and every day add a little bit of light. Thank you for joining us tonight. If you have any questions, comments, rebuttals, <laughs> Nice program. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for joining.